I think a good speech is like a mini skirt. It needs to be short enough to keep your attention, but long enough to cover the essentials. And today, I would like to talk about mobile future, as to give you an outlook also about key trends and topics which might be relevant today already, but will be more and more um, important in the next couple of years. If you talk about mobile, you need to talk about the air, um, the air around us, and also the digital oxygen which is around us, the connectivity. Like most of the people here in the room are always connected. You have your mobile device and you have these antennas like this one, covered probably um, like a tree. And it's also a change in generations because this digital oxygen is like used by the young um, kids already in very early years. And around one and a half years ago, I had a question together with a couple of experts in Germany and we thought about how will the future of mobile look like. So we started this uh, MoCom 2020 project and we had a, a theme and a vision behind it because I believe you can only create what you can imagine. And this is like what Jules Verne is actually doing with his books when he talked about the moon travels and things like that. For all people here in the room, I think it's essential to envision and to dream about how important mobile media could be because you need to go back in your companies and then make decisions and probably discuss why you need more money uh, to invest into mobile and how you can get more money out of mobile as well. So, and what we try to do is instead of doing a 300 pages study uh, with all the details which probably nobody reads in, in detail anyway, um, we created a think tank called Mocom 2020. And we spread out a couple of questions, like how will the future of mobile look, look like, how important is Facebook mobile, what are the key applications you're using, um, what are the key trends. And we spread these questions all around the web um, at um, conferences. And I've invited um, a couple of friends of mine um, because I, um, as uh, our probably explain a little bit. Uh, I'm a trend scout and I did uh, trend research uh, in the last couple of years as well. And uh, so I'm really looking into different markets. We did trend tours in Japan, in Korea, in New York, in, in other countries also in Europe to actually see what is different in these countries. Why are people using mobile more or what are other trends over there? So I invited a couple of friends to, into the, to the advisory board and uh, there have been 12 people uh, from all over the world and they actually started the conversation. So they took the topic over to Japan and uh, talked about issues there at events. And then we um, therefore invited more and more people uh, because it's in, like an open like crowdsourcing, open source research project and there are around 250 people um, who took part into in this research. And um, at the end, or, or during the whole process, we started with um, a community website to actually combine all the information. We created a video, which I'll show you in a second, um, with the key results. Because my impression in most of the high-level management meeting is you need to have it on one page, or in a couple of, like, three pages probably, what are your key topics? Or you show a video with the key topics. So we, we said, why not create one? And um, this video also went viral on, on the web. So we published it on YouTube, but also on other websites. And uh, it was also translated by the community. So by uh, some people who just like the project into uh, 10 languages already. And at the end for, um, like as a publication, we also, put the best articles and, and structured them in a way and um, published the book. And um, so now I would like to show you 
the video and give you a glimpse about the project. Can you turn on the sound? You can only create what you can imagine. In the year 2020, mobile media communication has radically transformed the economy and our daily living unimaginable in an earlier age. Everyone has access to information on his mobile devices and contributes to the community. However, the media as you know it has exceeded to exist. Mobile has turned the world into a global information hub and has opened radical new business opportunities. The 21st century has enclosed the power of the information age, looking back to a not so distant past. The road to mobile media revolution started at the beginning of the 20th century. 1906, the first US patent for a wireless phone was registered. 1973, the first mobile phone call was placed in New York City. 1979, the first commercial mobile phones were presented in Tokyo. 1982, Nokia introduced its first portable phone. 1991, the first GSM network opened in Finland. 1998, the first mobile content, a ringtone, was sold. 1999, the Black Bee was introduced starting the era of mobile email. 2001, the third generation of mobile phones was launched in Japan. Mixed reality is enriching the mobile experience. 2011, built-in sensors like GPS, temperature, humidity, light or compass chips create a new mobile business ecosystem, the sense economy. 2012, we reach the barrier of 1 trillion network devices. Machine-to-machine -machine communication, smart objects, ubiquitous computing create the Internet of Things. 2013 is the year of mobile broadband. LTE is offering up to 50 megabytes of network capacity for each user. People are living in a smart cloud. 2014. India, Africa and other emerging markets have reached 70% penetration rates. 2015. Mobile payment is becoming a mass phenomenon driven by near-field communication. Devices are adapting to our lifestyles and environments. It's the start of the physical personal device. Nanotechnology enables physical transformation according to their use and complete personalization in the process. 2016, the New York Times stops the delivery of printed newspapers and offers e-paper readers for one US dollar. News Corporation, Border, Springer and other publishing companies follow in 2017. Everyone reads the news on plastic paper and updates it on the go. 2017 is the climax of the mobile economy boom. The market of mobile media is bigger than all the other media channels together. This year, the introduction of multi-language or instant translation is bringing down the global information barriers for text and voice communication. 2018, the US government starts an initiative to increase mobile public security, the mobile agenda. The location of mobile data streams of each person will be tracked, analyzed and saved. We reach more than 8 billion people worldwide. 5 billion have a mobile phone, 2.5 billion including mobile internet access. The generation of digital natives has entered the business world. 2019, privacy, information access and control have become essential issues in the world's economy. Cybersecurity has become one of the most critical issues. In the year 2020, our world of mobile media is disruptive, engaging, interactive and controversial, but truly international. It is up to you how our future will look like. Don't lean back, be active and shape the environment of the future of mobile media and communication. MOCOM 2020 is an open think tank to envision the future of mobile media and communication. Join the conversation at mocom2020.com
So this is the little video we produced, and we covered uh, a lot of topics. So we tried to, we, we did a strategic road mapping process. So we took the trends we discussed and then tried to figure out when these issues or trends will actually create a hype or a, a boom or something like that. When will they be big? And um, some of them might even come faster than we think, and others might take a little bit longer. Uh, one example is, for example, the development of Facebook. Uh, with the video, I think the numbers are wrong, because in today we hit already 400 million users, and um, Facebook Mobile is the number one um, data traffic uh, application for mobile phones, so people really use it. I think in the US it's like 40% of the mobile data traffic, which is huge. And it's just one, one application. And um, so there are a couple of topics, but today I decided to bring you three and talk about these more in detail. One is the Internet of Things and how smart objects influence your business. Um, I would like to talk about global social objects and so, uh, global social capital and what we can learn from emerging markets and um, about the true change maker, the digital natives and how the net generation is changing our world. So just jump into the first topic, the Internet of Things, or um, like the expression uh, was used in the video, it's called sensor economy. It's, it's already happening in a way, because your devices are getting more complex. There are many sensors inside. So if you take an, an iPhone, for example, or an, an, an Nexus One or whatever, there are many sensors already built in, like a compass, um, GPS, uh, a light sensor also can tell you if it's dark or, or light, so the, the display can actually react to it. And so there's a prediction that in 2011 these sensors will actually create a new business environment. And I would like to give you a couple of examples on that. Um, one is definitely in the information business. Um, if you imagine that these devices just share the information they have, probably anonymously uh, on the web, um, you could create a very powerful weather um, station um, because if you have like temperature and humidity and just share it, um, and there are millions of people sharing this information from the phone, you really have local, lo local weather information data, which is not there yet, it's just a prediction. And there are a couple of stations, weather stations around in Europe. And so this could be a topic. But also in the area of uh, healthcare, there are already some digital clusters out uh, which communicate via Bluetooth <coughs> to your device. So they can tell temperature, heartbeat, they can track any medical information and just give it to your doctor or your personal information um, service. And But also, in a couple of commerce areas, it's really important. There are these smart meters which track, for example, your uh, usage of uh, energy at home or uh, usage of water or something like that. And these meters are normally manual, but they will be exchanged. And uh, in Europe, there are just the uh, European Commission is uh, passing a couple of laws that it needs to, uh, like all new buildings, needs to have these new digital smart meters which are connected um, to, to the internet or to any server to actually update the information right away. And what this actually creates is a way that you can track how much energy are you using during the day. And even if you like split it up into, into your house and, and um, apartment, you can actually tell which uh, devices are taking the most energy, for example, and why you're paying uh, so much during night or during day or something like that. And um, there are a couple of companies, um, like energy companies, who are um, developing um, things like that and introducing products into the market. And But also uh, Google is working on that intensively. There's the Google um, Smart Grid, and it's an application which you probably know from Google Analytics. And uh, the only thing is you don't take the data traffic in, you take the, the traffic from your smart meters and then you have a very powerful analytics tool. And it's already um, introduced and you can use it if you have a 
smart meter at home. You can plug it in. There's a prediction from Accenture that there will be one trillion network devices in two years. It's not, not far away. And it's already happening right now in the logistics uh, business. There are many of these smart network devices which have an RFID tag on it. So um, like FedEx and uh, like all these um, log log logistics companies, they're using it to track um, items, to track things. Uh, it's, it's used in the big supermarkets as well. Um, but what is new, coming new to this market is actually turning the mobile industry into a new hype because it's about machine-to-machine -machine communication where you plug a little SIM card into a device and the SIM card is connected via the, the, the wireless network and it's just sending out information like where is the object, who does it belong to, uh, is it on standby or is it active or something like that. So um, from the video, you've seen that in 2012 we reached uh, uh, this barrier of one trillion network devices and we create the Internet of Things. And if you think about what things could be connected, there could be some smart objects, uh, like for example, there is a button in your car already, uh, which is an SOS button which uh, doesn't need to any phone connection because there is a SIM card integrated automatically. And it uh, sends out information if you have an accident. Um, but also there are picture frames, there's your TomTom -tom navigation which has a like in live uh, traffic jam update on it and it's all using these SIM cards. And, um, but also in the monitoring area it's used uh, as well as in um, netbooks, for example, which are not used to do phone calls, uh, as well as on the iPad. Uh, there will be the iPad 3G, which has a special, like a micro SIM card in it, and uh, you'll have a mobile connection anywhere. But it's not used for telephone, so it's just for data communication. And if you think about what could be um, useful information from anything um, talking to you. Uh, there's a good example about how a vision could look like. The, the company is called Thing V. It's a, it's a starter, uh, they don't have much use at yet, but I think the vision um, of the company is very interesting. Um, they create a list, uh, it's like status updates of things. So if you know Twitter, you know that um, we do like status updates like humans write them and say, I'm here, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And here you can register a thing. And the first um, step you'll take is you'll get a, an identity code for your item. So if you think about the internet, it's about um, connecting computers, servers, and each computer has an IP, a unique identity um, number. And they create, or they want to create, such a number of things. And then these things, um, at the moment it's manually, um, that you like update where it is, for example, you have an overview of your things belonging to at home. Or if you rent somebody, like a DVD, you can just type in, I rented it to this person. And then you have all your things uh, as a, like in a stock overview, what you have. But uh, the idea is actually, that these things tell where they are automatically. With mobile phones it's possible, but uh, with other things um, could be also possible in the future. And what they're creating is a, is a mobile data stream of um, things. And this data stream, like on Twitter, can be very powerful. So my question here would be, how will be, uh, who will create the Twitter of things? Because if you create an open stream of things telling where they are and um, uh, what, what they are doing, for example, uh, this information could be used by others to build applications on. Just a very simple example is um, if you're traveling a lot, you have your luggage and sometimes it's lost, so it would be good to uh, know where your luggage is and probably your suitcase can tell where it's, uh, uh, its location at the moment, but with a very cheap and simple tag, for example. So this could be a very simple uh, application, but very useful for all the travelers. 
The second topic I would like to talk about is a social topic. Uh, it's called social capital, and it's really about the emerging markets. Uh, because in the next 10 years, we will hit the penetration rate in India and Africa, which is can be compared to ours. Um, in the video, we said like 70% in the next four years. It's really growing dramatically, and it's. Uh, really, the, the future market uh, for for the um, MNOs, the mobile network operators. So, if these markets reach the, these penetration rates, it's uh, at the moment the place where the network operators um, see their growth and invest money. But if you look at the mobile evolution of devices, we are now at the stage that going smaller and smaller and their devices are very powerful that actually it doesn't matter so much if you have this phone or that phone most of the phones have a very uh, good application and, and, and you have mobile web and you have um, SMS and things where you work on so it's not really a matter of technology anymore even in, the, in those markets it's about it's a social um, change for example in Kenya in 2007, they started mobile commerce, so people could do transactional transactions, very small money transactions, if they are on a market and they don't need to bring the money because they might be robbed or something like that. They can text with a simple short message. They can text money over, like micro micro money. And what happened uh, within um, a couple of years that there are like uh, two two million transactions daily and over 6.5 million subscribers. Um, like phones, actually. But what is more interesting is that uh, people are also sharing the phones because at the beginning, like also in, in 2007, probably one person in a family had a, a phone or one person in a, in a village or something, and they actually shared uh, bank accounts. So could you imagine sharing your bank account with your uh, person sitting next to you or with your colleagues? Um, probably not, but they're doing it and they're also creating new business models. So in Bangladesh, for example, there's a, a business um, called the, the Mobile Phone Ladies, actually, and they're renting out phones to other people who don't have phones to do phone calls. And this was started mainly by um, one of the Nobel Peace laureates, Mohammed Yunus, who um, started a bank to do microfinancing, so they, they give away like um, small amounts of money to people who don't have any reputation or don't even have a bank account or something like that, and um, to start a business. And but they did not only give away money; they also gave gave them an idea. And one idea was actually to rent mobile phones. So for like 30 euros, you could buy a mobile phone over there and then start a, like renting it out and it was a good way for them to pay back the money and also to earn uh, to earn a living. And now in Bangladesh there are like 400,000 uh, mobile phones already. Um, so the, the business is going down a little bit and they now created like the internet lake is how Mohammed Jones called it. Um, so they are having, they are small netbooks and they are like sharing these netbooks with the community. Here you can see like Skype calling and things like that. So it's not really a matter of technology, even if their devices are not as powerful as ours. Um, they can already do a lot with them. It's more about a social change, a, so, a social competence. And it's the first time, actually, um, from our perspective, that uh, we as a developed country can look into the undeveloped countries and see what we can learn from them. And um, this like, uh, social capital of sharing, this um, social differences, they could be very powerful if you combine it to services over here as well. And uh, some things might be very interesting to bring over, but uh, others probably are, um, uh, from a, a cultural perspective, not possible. But it's uh, always, if, if you're looking on trends, it's always interesting to see if this trend would be come true also uh, at our place. And third, I would like to talk about the truth change makers, the digital natives. These are the people who are growing up with all this information technology from scratch. And 
these digital natives um, on a global level will reach a massive amount of people. So um, five million people will have a mobile phone and half of them, there's an estimation uh, that they, half of them will have a mobile internet connection as well. So at the moment, you have to remind yourself the internet has one billion users compared to 2.5 billion mobile phone users in a couple of years. And um, so from my perspective, I think mobile must change also a lot of business models. And there, it will be a huge market. And there will be a boom, uh, which we can't imagine, because it's just triple the size of, of the internet. And um, especially the, this generation of digital natives, if they enter the business world, they will do decisions differently. They will use things differently. They will uh, consume media differently. And uh, one key topic about it, everything is getting faster. It's about a real-time web. And especially if um, things are like uh, things like earthquakes or high ET or things like that are happening, or in Iran, for example, um, people are using this real-time web and Twitter um, to go behind um, normal and traditional media and spread the message. And one, one very interesting example was the earthquake in China in May 2009. Because such earthquake already happened in China before. But uh, last time such an earthquake happened, the government took three months to decline that there was an earthquake. And we probably didn't hear about anything. And there, on the same day when it happened, people were just like posting photos, they were sharing things, and also Chinese people outside of China were like spreading it. And so they couldn't neglect that there was the earthquake and it was a big, big topic, of course. And um, also government is turning uh, to, to Twitter and to other uh, media. So our chancellor in Germany uh, said that it's part of the press and um, press freedom and uh, freedom of expression as well. And so this is a, from a German perspective, it's a small sign that uh, um, they understand what Obama did in the US. And talking about Twitter, I just wanted to drop the number. It's 25 million tweets per day at the moment. It's growing rapidly. And what is interesting as well, it's, it's not so much the young generation who's using it. There are more Facebook and local social networks. It's really uh, the business generation, the older, like uh, the average Twitter user is 37 years old. And um, so it's not, not about the teens. And talking about all these apps um, uh, this morning also here, um, I wanted to just show you a couple of examples. Um, like in Pizza Hut in the US, they um, had in the first three months of their app, they had a million uh, dollar revenue. Uh, no, a million uh, orders, sorry. And um, eBay, during the Christmas season, sold over 1.5 million items um, on their mobile app. And what is also very powerful are all these uh, apps and, and developments which are, which are going on and which the digital generation is just using um, during when they grow up. And one very interesting application is uh, Google Goggles. It's where you point your camera or phone uh, to a site, probably um, like a, a bridge or here like San Francisco, Golden Gate Bridge, or any other site when you're traveling. And it's uh, analyzing your photo and gives you a search result within a couple of seconds. And it really works. It's really fascinating if you try even more complicated things. And there is a picture recognition engine on, on the phone and on the device um, which re works really good with, with objects, houses, and architecture. And it's, uh, it's not working with any faces or snow face recognition or something. It's not that powerful. But uh, with objects, it's really working well. Another um, company is called Layer. And uh, they are creating augmented reality uh, 
use cases as well. So it's an application where you can also point your camera phone. It, uh, the phone has the exact GPS location or a compass tells in which direction are you looking at and it gives you useful information. So there, uh, you can have, uh, they call it sticky notes, you can leave notes about restaurants, about your favorite food or something like that. It's, uh, you can find information about uh, things which are important to, to this region, like here at Abbey Road, you'll find information about the Beatles. Um, but also you can integrate art or any pictures with also with local content, like tweets or Twitter messages, which are sent directly from here, from this hotel, for example. You can look them up again with a location position. And, um, and you probably read that uh, Google Buzz is launched, um, I think, yesterday. And uh, this is exactly uh, also using this location information. So it's uh, creating a connection between your location, things around you, and things you care about around you. Another um, a good example for that is um, Foursquare. Foursquare is a company who actually um, gives you the opportunity to pro promote your favorite places. Um, so um, you can actually check in into a, into a restaurant with your mobile device and tell your friends on any social network or Facebook or Twitter, or any, any social network you choose, um, that you're actually at this location at the moment. And from a marketing perspective, um, besides it's on all the phones and things like that, um, you can really see that like Tim is at uh, Dunkin' Donuts and this is kind of a social marketing activity because Tim is doing promotion for the restaurant. And um, it's turning around um, like traditional marketing efforts a lot because it's really creating a relevance for you because you probably don't care about anybody going there, but if Tim is your best friend, you probably care about it. And then you get all these messages and things like that. So Foursquare is really something you should try out. But another company and application which is interesting and which I would like to show you uh, is Siri. Um, who knows Siri already? Okay. Well, of course, yeah. <laughs> you should know. And uh, there's a demo of it. Probably you will just um, look into it. It's a personal assistant. And the way it works is really simple and um, will be explained in the video. And I think it's also something which will be important for the digital generation as well if they grow up with this powerful tools. This is a quick demonstration of Siri, the personal assistant on your phone. Siri helps you get things done when you're on the go. Using Siri couldn't be easier. Just press the green button and say what you want. I'd like a romantic place for Italian food near my office. Siri sends my words out to be interpreted as text, waits for my confirmation, and then gets to work for me. It looks at multiple sources of information to find a solution to my problem. In this case, it found several Italian restaurants. It looked at the reviews from several sources. This one seems to be well-reviewed, so this is a great romantic place. I can show it on the map, and I can send it to my friend via email. We'll meet there. If you already know the place you want, you can ask Siri to get you a reservation directly. I'd like a table for two at Il Fornaio in San Jose tomorrow night at 7.30. Siri contacts reservation services, in this case Open Table, to see what's available at your stated request. Looks like there's a table available at 7.30, and with one click we can confirm our table reservation. Let's say we want to plan to go to a movie after. I've heard Avatar is great in 3D and IMAX. Let's see if we can uh, find a theater showing it that way. Where can I see Avatar in 3D IMAX? Siri checks within the context of my dinner planning in San Jose. It looks for IMAX theaters that play in Avatar nearby, and it shows the times of all the theaters here. You can see the trailer, you can read about the plot, you can see the theaters on a map, and you can get tickets uh, directly inside Siri. Let's pick the 945 show. 
You can also ask open-ended questions and have Siri guide you to discover new things. I'm thinking about what to do this weekend. Let's ask Siri for some ideas. What's happening this weekend around here? Siri knows where I am because of the phone, in this case, Cupertino. So it checks for events around Cupertino, scheduled for this weekend. I see that there's concerts and live music and some theater. You interact with Siri in a dialogue. For example, you can change your requests in normal English as you would with a human assistant. Let's ask Siri to check So I think you, you get it. There's a, there are more samples coming up. Um, so this is a one application. If you think about it, using your voice and all the information which is already out there, but it, like combined in a very logical and clever way, uh, it could really change the way we make business also. And these are just a couple of examples which I think are interesting, um, which are just natural for all the people who are growing up. And in 2018, like we said in the video, most of the digital natives, the next generation, will enter the business world. So they will probably do things differently. To, to sum up, um, I explained how the Internet of Things is working. I talked about global social capital and what we can learn from emerging markets. And I talked about the change makers, uh, the true digital natives. So um, I'm looking forward to your questions. And thank you very much. I think we can get some questions, right? Yes. Yeah. Any questions? <coughs> Hello, uh, and thank you for your nice presentation and also your speech. Uh, actually, I would like to know more about the, the future of social advertising, uh, social mobile advertising. I mean, uh, the like services, services like Foursquare, the great opportunity uh, for new revenge channels. So, uh, what do you think about these opportunities for advertisers? Uh, I'd like to hear more details about it. Because you were uh, like per check in advertising models or per, uh, pop, per post, paper post style advertising models. What do you think about these? Like with online advertising in general, um, there's too much money wasted at the moment. Because um, if you do pay for a banner or any um, online advertisement at the moment, it's really not um, fit to the user who's looking for. And with turning, like creating a social um, online marketing um, tool like Foursquare or like um, socialmedia.com, for example, they're really bringing in the human factor and. Um, each consumer, as you know, is confronted with like 3,000 advertising messages per day. So they need to filter out what's relevant for them. And if you have uh, a recommendation by your friend, it's much more relevant for you personally than um, uh, if it's just a normal ad. And especially if you're in a like, mobile business, for example, if you're interested in mobile topics, um, you care more about things which probably other people in the room are also reading. And if you get a recommendation about a good article, a good book, a good um, restaurant for all the mobile people in Istanbul are meeting, for example, uh, this might be more relevant. I, th I think that's really turning around marketing and probably uh, opening up a new space where you um, don't have to waste so much money, uh, but really focus on things and then probably be much more effective with your messages. So I think it's an opportunity, actually. So you think it was a good question? It's a good question. So let's give him a book. Yes. <coughs> I, I think he's going to ask you to sign as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. yeah. OK, so I have three, um, no, actually four more books to give away. So you next question. Put, put mine somewhere there. Yeah. Oh, there's mine, yeah? You, you always separate mine? Yeah. Oh, okay, so <laughs> you can do all of it. Uh, what about the data sharing and privacy? I think that's a major topic. 
we just uh, touched it at the end of the video a little bit uh, with the topic of cybersecurity. Um, but actually, when we discussed it with the community, uh, it was, was much <coughs> was a much bigger topic. We talked about uh, uh, like a revolution actually where people neglect to use any services anymore. They don't want to be um, controlled by the government or something like that. Uh, there are many examples out there at the moment where people really discuss this and um, the consumers uh, are, don't really want to be tracked all the time. Uh, one example is in Japan, for example, every new phone has to have a GPS center in it. And because the government said, due to security reasons, uh, it would be good if there is an accident or something to track the people. But actually, you don't know what is happening with the data. And uh, it's a security issue. But also, uh, viruses and cyber terrorists, they are using mobile, or they will use mobile in the future to, for their uh, purposes. And um, so the, the market of mobile security can be also uh, an opportunity for you because it's a, it's a big business and there needs to be security. And also from the consumer side, I think there will be big discussions. And uh, so like in the video, we talked about the mobile agenda where like governments get together and track and analyze information. And it's uh, yeah, a really tough uh, discussion, but also a market. So there are two sides. So you like the question? Yeah. It's a good one. We have two more questions, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, first of all, relate to the last question, actually. Oh, yeah, so, so is it, yeah, let's get this question first of all. There's some left with this one. Uh, yeah, we are discussing the privacy issue, and you said that it will be a really uh, an important issue to discuss, actually. But do you think the young people, the young generation, or the net generation, as you say, will really care about that? Um, the understanding will be quite different now. We are discussing the issue at the moment and discussed mostly by the old people. Now. But after 10 years, do you think that the young generation will be not forced but made to believe that they can easily share their personal information? It's, they really, it's not really important thing. Um, it's, it's, it's I think that the, the next generation is thinking about security issues differently. I think, first of all, what they what they share or what we have in common with them is they probably care more, even more about um, what they share and where they share, and also about the the ownership of content. So a big issue for for like more open uh, developments is actually if you share content on on Facebook or upload a video on YouTube. Um, all these rights are actually not so clear that if you still own your content. And what the digital natives or like a lot of people really care about is that they still own it and they can probably also switch from one platform to another and their content, uh, what they produce, is owned by them. But what is different, um, so I think this is something which is similar, so about ownership of content, um, but what is different is truly about the openness. Because they don't care so much or, uh, about the information they share. They share much more. They share their location, their food they like, the restaurants they go to. And that's really a, a difference, in, a cultural difference. Because we don't probably even uh, don't want to read so much information like that. We don't share so much information in uh, like more daily small messages, for example. Um, what, what you're doing right now, or what you are watching right now on television, or thing, things like that. But it's from the, the digital natives to just do it. And they share so, so many information. But um, what is important to them is that they also have an, 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 like an ownership or an overview of their, of their things they are sharing. So I think what would not work from, from the platform side is that you take the content and then don't give them any opportunity to delete it at the end or to take it to another platform or something like that. So it's, um, it's a cultural difference. They're more open to share things. 
and this will be an opportunity also to like do advertising for example to uh, do viral marketing campaigns uh, but also or for the NSA national security <laughs> agency to know where I am yeah because you have your GPS on your phone yes and you, you will share it yeah through but what is interesting is with with the generation who are in between what they have shared already um, and there have been a couple of magazines who did that so they they, present, they invited somebody from the street and then they did a like one hour research and then presented all the information they have online and they were shocked like they they knew where they have been holidays uh, they they know all, all of our uh, all about their friends what uh, videos they've watched and whatever so it's really um, uh, something which also digital natives have to learn and this is something for education as well because um, like they have to grow into that mind that they they really have to manage in a way their digital reputation yeah. Yeah. Okay. thank you um, hi my yes my question is about uh, mobile application platforms uh, do you think that uh, the mobile application platforms will continue to diversify or uh, do you think that uh, we will see a success like Apple's? Um, I think like from the platform side there are um, like two main players uh, like iTunes, the App Store and Android market and there might be probably an open market as well and uh, uh, but there is a, a big discussion actually going on about apps and mobile web. And a lot of smart people actually don't believe in apps so much on, on a long-term view. Because uh, you need to invest a lot of programming power into one application which perfectly fits one device, but probably is not suitable to another device. While a mobile website um, is, is more flexible and uh, probably also faster in, in some uh, processes. So um, there are a lot of people and really like smart people who really believe in the mobile web more than in the, in the app market. But at the moment, or probably also for the next uh, three years, uh, I would say you can make a lot of money with very smart apps um, because it's just so easy for the people to download it and they have a um, also all, always a component which is downloaded so you're not um, you don't need a, a con internet connection all the time you can probably use it on, to reflect also when you're offline uh, but as the connection are getting better LTE will be introduced with the fourth generation of uh, mobile networks this will be uh, like all online applications might be more powerful than uh, so this will be another switch probably in the future. But for now, it's with apps, it's, uh, it's very interesting to see what's going on there. Does it uh, answer your question? Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, I have a quick question, and that has to do with the uh, .mobi domain name. Um, as you know, it was introduced about four or five years ago or so, and was endorsed by both the um, telecom operators as well as the um, device manufacturers, but there really hasn't been that much of a um, movement on that. Um, and I was wondering if there is any reason why that hasn't really caught on, or is it going to? Because I'm, I'm seeing all these major um, operators as well as um, sites, uh, and they don't have a uh, Mobi extension. I see you don't either, and a lot of people don't. But then they are in the mobile um, sphere. What do you think is the reason for that? I think the reason for that is that Mobi is a very clever way. They have, they have created standards, a way you can say every .mobi domain works on, on any mobile or on many, many mobile devices. Very good. It, it has the standards that you can really um, trust on it, that a .mobi domain is always working, it's useful, and things like that. So they come up with, with some standards. But the, the basic problem about the, the .mobi is it's done like the old economy way. So the big guys, the big companies get got together like Nokia and Ericsson and uh, Google and other, other people like thought, okay, let's do, let's create a standard that would be good, good idea, let's create a standard. 
and then they came up with this list of things. If you want to create a .mobi domain, you need to um, guarantee that it's working on these devices. And it's also, from a development perspective, probably not uh, so uh, useful to create something which is working on all standards. Probably you, as a startup, you just do it for the iPhone at the beginning or for Android and then see what's happening. And um, uh, so you actually don't need to have a .mobi domain um, to have a mobile application. So for, at Facebook or at Google, I think it's m.google.com, m.facebook.com. And um, the only problem from a consumer perspective, and also if you're looking from a trend perspective, is um, the good idea behind the .mobi domain is that people could learn it, that it's, there is a mobile site and they just type in um, turkcell.mobi, for example, they get a mobile site. And at the moment you have to type in uh, probably at Google uh, mobile and then search for a mobile site and it gives you a result. So um, it could be easier, but uh, it's always hard to introduce a standard into any market. So um, it's, it might be good for, for the big uh, companies, but uh, for a lot of like very dynamic companies, it's not necessary to have it on So um, are you saying that then those that uh, companies or sites that do have a dot mobi, so that <coughs> you exactly guarantee that they have the right infrastructure, so when you go to that site, then you'll have a uh, more, say, robust experience or a better mobile experience. Yes. Yeah. So there, there's like a, a list of things uh, you need to make sure if you register a domain that the website you're, you're publishing um, works on a couple of devices, has specific mobile uh, programming language, and uh, which is very, very useful. Um, but uh, like from a market perspective, it's really hard to force to do something like that. And it's uh, from the mobile internet, it's also very smooth development. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Is there another question? Yes. Um, when we talk about social um, media marketing, how do you think uh, should the success be measured? Social media marketing. Yeah. Oh, there are many many discussions about the ROE, the return of investment on social media marketing, and uh, what is totally makes sense is that you can't measure it uh, with the no, with the old um, regulations. So a, a view, for example, is uh, cannot be compared to a view in a normal magazine or a banner or something like that. So at the moment, the like smartest way is actually to measure uh, return on investment in a way is a combination of a couple of criteria. And these criteria could be also flexible on the goals you have in mind. So um, could be a goal that you want to sell, sell more. Uh, then uh, you can combine it with the, uh, with the clicks, of course, and then with people who actually bought it. But if you want to do uh, like a more branding uh, campaign, it uh, could be the factor of people recommendation uh, to other people. So uh, at Twitter, it could be the number of retweets. At Facebook, it could be the number of people like recommendation, recommending uh, a Facebook fan page to others. And then there are some some things where you can probably also measure their response rate. Is that uh, like Starbucks, who has like four and a half million uh, Facebook fans or something like that? They introduced a, a birthday card when you have birthday. You can download a little paper or something and go to into into Starbucks and get a copy. And they actually tracked. How many people did that? So they could learn also how they, um, if they do campaigns, <coughs> how good is the response rate? Um, obviously, it was a free product, so it was a very good response rate, but it's going to be also used uh, for other products. And um, yeah, so it's really about recommendation, which is a powerful um, criteria. And uh, at the moment, the most smart things I've, I've seen is a combination of a couple of criteria really suited and, and, and customized to your campaign. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have any more books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but probably more questions. Eh? I can shout. Yep.
The question is about the yeah. news reporting. Uh, news reporting, yes. Yeah. I, okay. I need your projections uh, about, about future news reporting. Mm -hmm. um, as, like talking about the future of news, it's um, from my perspective as a trend scout, I uh, really believe into new models. And I'm very optimistic about new models. So uh, if you compare, um, look at the Huffington Post, for example, and how they structure a news business in a way to create uh, high quality content and compare it to any big newspaper, their, the, the, the headcount of people and their um, like the people they use to produce one uh, article is like one to ten or something like that. So um, it's it's turning around journalism in a way. Um, it's not anymore that you're writing just an article. It's a mixture of media. So you need to uh, take a photo instantly, uh, put it on Twitter, and then probably write a couple of things about it, do a video interview and things like that. So journalists need to be more um, uh, general, actually, with, with users of media. And from a consumption side, I think, it's uh, really a matter, just a matter of time, that people will turn to uh, digital devices to read um, newspaper, and it's just so in inefficient. Also, if you look about the massive amount of tons of paper transported from A to B just to sell news, and so you could save all this. And um, a friend of mine in New York told me that um, last year. When you were like in the subway, you said, "Oh, there's somebody having a Kindle, an Amazon Kindle, reading a book or a newspaper or a blog on his uh, e-paper device." And now, like everybody has it. There, there are nukes from Barnes and Noble. There is the Kindle, and uh, it's just so common, like like an iPhone. Um, I mean, New York is special as well, but it's it's there's a turning point. Really. But you can't share uh, it, it's in newspaper. Somebody with your father, because your mobile device you're burning, and you're you're carrying it all the time. Yeah. And I would uh, let's do a paper newspaper. Uh, you can share it uh, everywhere, or land someone. That's right. You you buy one, and the whole family can read that newspaper. Yeah, that's true. So it's normally a mobile device belongs to you. So if you have a the iPad, for example, you won't share it. Uh, but if devices are getting cheaper and cheaper, and like the Amazon Kindle is probably uh, $300, but the production is probably $70 or whatever, and if there are millions produced and the quality is getting better and the material is probably flexible as well, as prototypes show, um, I believe that if like the New York Times will start uh, to give it away for free or for a dollar, um, it might be a very uh, common way to use it. And then you would share it because it's just a dollar, so you would probably share it with the family as well. So it's the same dilemma that it's, uh, it's also a waste of plastic or digital equipment, isn't it? Just like that. Yes, yeah. And it's, uh, it's a pollution as well. <laughs> yeah, it is a pollution as well, yeah. There's a very good example. I didn't have it on my laptop right now. If you want to see how a news magazine is could be um, could be realized on the iPad. There's an example by Sports Illustrated. So you just need to type in Sports Illustrated in YouTube and the iPad, and then you will get um, a very impressive example of how a newspaper or it's a, a weekly magazine could look like on such a device, and it's uh, really using the power of, of the device um, in a way. And I think that's. Well, what people also want to pay for because it's such a good experience. Has it been done before by Bonnier Magazine International, International Magazine Publishers actually on a, on a different platform? I've seen it actually, the videos, and you've seen it too. Uh, which one? Uh, Bonnier International Magazine Publishers. Okay. It's the third biggest, uh, mm -hmm. I guess. They show their Vogue magazine and uh, Sports Illustrated also. Okay, yeah. So I, I think so. The, the, the example is not the first Yeah. The example I've seen is actually also a couple of months old, um, but it's, 
it was made for for the iPad, but you don't see that it's an Apple product, so it's just like a tablet or something like that. Okay, so that is all about the future of mobile. And uh, there's one can you share can you share your comments about the mobile TV? Mm -hmm. What will be the future of mobile TV in, in the short term and the mid term? On with mobile TV, it's interesting. First of all, to look into markets where it's already introduced since years. It's Korea and Japan, and they have uh, they started with the with, your, with the mobile phones with the bigger screen and the little antenna, which really looks stupid because it looks like a little TV, and they have um, digital uh, terrestrial um, uh, networks within the cities, and as the space in Japan is limited as well. People just watch on the go and even watch at home on their device. I think this is something special cultural in Asia, which might not happen over here. But um, what, what you can learn from the applications who offer mobile TV at the moment is that like live events are very popular and also add-ons. So if you have uh, a game show and then you have something where you can also bet on, on something, there is special uh, information you can add on any TV um, sessions and this is really uh, one of the key uh, <coughs> unique selling propositions of such apps. And um, But it's, it's definitely becoming more and more popular. Probably at home um, we are used to a bigger screen but it, then it's a combination. You could use the mobile phone as a back channel or something like that and it's, you could combine it with the TV channel you're using already or you just like take the content and also see it on your uh, on your bigger uh, on your screen at home for example. Okay. So thank you so much for being with us and for this great speech.